Good afternoon and welcome to this, our fifth and final lecture series of the Looking Ahead Lecture Series for the University of Newcastle in 2020. My name's Lauren Collier. I am a proud Banjan woman and my grandmother's country is from Hinchinbrook Island in Queensland. Um, I myself studied here in Wallatooka and am an alumni of the law school. I spent um, many years out practicing after graduating and um, am, am proud to be back here in Wallatooka today with all of you. I have the privilege today to be able to join with such well-respected and inspiring leaders to talk about issues that are really close to my heart, um, and that is education, legal issues, and improving the lives of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters out there in the community. So before we begin our discussions today, I, we are all lucky to have the wonderful and deadly dancers here from Adamstown Public School. So I'd like to welcome them um, here today and they are also going to perform our Acknowledgement of Country. So I will hand you over to our wonderful guys over here.
Hi, my name is Kane, and my father is Aboriginal. I'm still trying to find the background knowledge of my family. Geez, I finally feel like I belong. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on the Awabakal land. Thank you. Wasn't that an inspiring introduction to our event today? My name's Mark Hoffman. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic, and it's my role to welcome you here on behalf of the university. This is our fifth, final, and arguably most important looking ahead lectures for the year. The focus is Black Lives Still Matter, a momentum for change. The University of Newcastle leads, is, plays a leading role in our country in Indigenous advancement. Based here at the Wallatooka Institute in this wonderful building where we are today. It's now my pleasure to introduce the University of Newcastle's Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy and Leadership, Mr Nathan Towney, who will lead the event today. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you everyone who is here in the building today. Um, some very well-respected people that I admire very much that have made the time to be here. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and also to the people that have taken the time to uh, zoom in and, and dial in today. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, when I was asked to give the fifth and final Looking Ahead Lecture Series lecture, uh, I thought about long and hard what I wanted to talk about. And at the time, there are a lot of things happening around the world and um, in this country. And I thought it would be really inspiring to have a panel discussion about the Black Lives Matter movement. And in particular, talk a little bit about where that stems from. And it really does stem from historical inequality. And let's have a really open and honest conversation about that with people that have different lived experience and different ex expertise in that area. And so I'm really excited about having that discussion today. Uh, I've got a wonderful panel arranged and then I'm going to come back after the panel and, uh, and give a, a, have a more of a conversation about the role that the university can play in advancing outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I want to uh, have as much time as we can for the panel discussion because that's what I'm most excited about and I'd like to introduce our panel members. Uh, first I'd like to introduce a gentleman that has two very important titles. Uh, the first one to me is Uncle. Uh, but he also ha holds the title of Professor. I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Bob Morgan, uh, a proud Gomorrah man uh, from Walgett, New South Wales. I've been lucky enough to go to Walgett with Uncle Bob and hear some of the stories of where he grew up, and I've, I'm very privileged to have heard that. Uh, very well-respected academic uh, and educator, uh, has been in the game for a long time and has been instrumental in advancing lots of outcomes, not only at this university, but across the country. So, Uncle Bob, thank you very much for taking the time. Our second member is Sharon Clayton, uh, the federal member for Newcastle. Sharon, thank you much, very much for being here. I know how passionate you are about uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. I know that stemmed from time working in WA. And um, yeah, we, we really appreciate the support that you've shown, not only to me and the university, but also uh, fighting the fight in at Canberra. And I know we all know how hard that can be. Um, thank you for not giving up and thank you for always being there um, and always saying yes to events like this. It really does mean a lot. Uh, the third panel member is a proud Wiradjuri man um, from God's country, Wellington, New South Wales, uh, Jeffrey Amato. <coughs> Jeff Amato. Uh, Jeff was actually in my kindergarten class oh. and so we go back a long way uh, and someone that I'm really proud of. Um, Jeff will share part of his story today, but um, it, it's no secret and that Jeff had uh, a, a bit of a troubled background, um, spent a bit of time in, in juvenile justice and um, incarceration uh, with drug and alcohol issues, um, went to the Glen Drug and Alcohol Rehabilitation Centre and has now been 11 years clean and sober. And I'm, for that, I'm extremely proud of you, brother, because I know where you've come from, I know how hard it's been, yeah. and I'm just so proud to have you here on the discussion today. Um, Jeff now works as an advocate in Aboriginal communities, really trying to ensure that maybe we build more drug and alcohol rehabilitation centres that have played a significant role in his life as opposed to building jails. Um, I'm, Jeff has also been a, a proud advocate and uh, just re the Dubbo community have just um, received $10 million for a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre and that's a lot of the work that Jeff's done, so congratulations. Uh, our 
Fourth panel member is another proud Wiradjuri person from uh, Dubbo, New South Wales, uh, Taylor Gray. Taylor is a fifth year law student, just about finished, 5,000 words to go <laughs> in the final thesis. I think that deserves a round of applause in itself. <laughs> Taylor is an extremely passionate advocate for doing what's right. And that's what has made her so keen to get it, go down that law space. And I know that she'll share some of that story today around why she's so passionate about that. Um, Taylor was instrumental in the Black Lives Matter movement here in Newcastle, went to Sydney and fought the good fight to ensure that those protests could continue. Uh, very well respected and Taylor, really um, proud that you're here today. Um, know your dad very well, and I'm just very, very proud that you're, you're here. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand back to Lauren Collier, who's going to facilitate the panel discussion, uh, and then I'm going to come back at the end and, and round things up and talk a little bit more about the university and the role that we think we can play. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, um, and thank you again to all our panellists um, for coming to have this discussion today. Um, you know, power is gained by sharing knowledge, so we're really grateful um, to everyone for your time today. Um, Jeff, if we can start with you, because I think that your story is, um, is really important for everyone to hear, and it really highlights some of the issues, you know, both good, but also, sorry, you know, some of the problems with, um, you know, the legal and educational issues, but also the resilience and mm. the power of Aboriginal people to overcome um, those issues. So if you don't mind telling us a little bit about your journey yep. um, and how you came to be here today. Yeah, for sure. But uh, before I go any further, I think um, I want to do the most important thing, that acknowledge country I'm on, the Wapikal people, you know, our elders past the present and our, our next um, leaders, elders that are emerging, you know. So for those that don't know me, as, as the brother boy, Naif, you know, um, just to introduce my name is Jeff Amato and I'm a proud Radjuri man from from Wallach, New South Wales and yeah he's right God, God's country you know and um, <clears throat> no but just a little bit about me and and what I'm passionate about and what I've done um, I fell into the lifestyle of heavy drug addiction alcoholism incarceration and I suppose um, where I got to where I am today is I was pretty privileged and fortunate enough to get introduced to a place that um, that helped me deal with my trauma, my alcoholism, my, my mental health. Instead of, instead of always thinking the, the number one, the first choice should be, you know, jail, jail, jail. I, I was pretty enough fortunate introduced to the, the Glen Rehabilitation Centre and me being an Indigenous man and an Aboriginal Indigenous Rehabilitation Centre, it's where um, <clears throat> I came back in contact with my culture. You know, because when they're sending us to prison, what they're doing, they're sending us to prison with untreated alcoholism, untreated drug addiction, untreated mental health, untreated trauma. And this is why we're falling back into the gap and our, and our people are being locked away so much is because we're not dealing with our... The real core issues is why we're re-offending. You know, we're re-offending about 85% of it's under the influence of drugs and alcohol, so <coughs> prison didn't work for me. You know, what worked for me was a place to get to where I could start to start to deal with the stuff that was going on for me. And um, me being an Indigenous man, that, that Indigenous place, that's where I healed. That's where I healed. I found the fire in my belly now to push for my people to say, listen, prison's not working for our people. You know? and, and the only way I can speak highly of that, because I lived it. I, I'm, I don't think you can get any, any more power than someone that inflicted experience that's come out the other end to, to tell their story on what's working for our people and what's not working for our people. So that's a little bit about um, where I got to where I am today. You know, I was pretty fortunate enough. I travel around Australia now into prisons, rehabilitation centre organisations, communities, schools, etc. What can do, what can benefit from my talk on on how I healed as an Indigenous man, and and, and I'm still here three years later travelling Australia. You know, so I've received some really big big awards for the the, the work I'm doing in community, but um, I'm so passionate about. What we need in this country is, is, is more cultural rehabs and less jails for our people. You know, me personally, I think that the government's fallen short about a billion dollars a year to close the gap for drugs, alcohol and mental health. Thank you. And I mean, th thank you for sharing that. And you know, because you've been, you know, you've seen um, how these things work on the other side, you've been in prison, um, you've been, worked with so many people that you know, have needed your help. What did you think about the recent Black Lives Matter movement? 
I love the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and I think it should have happened a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty privileged enough to, to have marched it on the Central Coast, dark and young country, and <clears throat> just having my kids, educate my kids and, and educate in this country on, on this is what's happening in our country. We can't sugarcoat this for no, no longer, you know. We've got to start talking about the, the Black Lives Matter. And, and I can't wait to, to get, and I'm privileged enough to say I'll, I will be marching in the next one. That we've got to do it, you know, sooner than later to keep the movement happening. But, yeah, this, this country's, the truth's got to be told. You know, as an Indigenous people, our statistics way up any, any other culture in our own country. You know, for the suicide rate, for the drug and alcohol addiction, for the incarceration, for the, you know, for the, I, I suppose, what, what doesn't sit right with me is, is um, as Indigenous people, we're the poorest culture in our own country, you know, and, and, and um, <clears throat> the Black Lives Matter, this should have happened a long time ago. But it's happening and, and Australia is aware of what, what us Indigenous people are going through and it's so important to keep the movement happening. Mm. We can't stop now, we've got to keep moving. I might jump over to you, um, Taylor as one of the organisers of the Black Lives Matter rallies here in Newcastle. Um, could you talk to us a bit about the process that you had to go through to get those rallies even happening? Um, and, you know, what was inspiring you? What was driving you to, to fight that fight? Because it was a bit of a fight to even get that happening, wasn't yeah, it? it was. Yeah, yes. um, Yeah, so before I dive into that, I'd just like to acknowledge country as well, um, the Awabakal country and the elders in the crowds there. And um, know that I stand on your shoulders, as you know, and my education here is possible because of the fight and the legacy that you've left behind. And ain't no power like black people because black people are the power. Um, yeah, well, it, was a, it was a very tough fight, yeah, through the courts. I, I, um, people are probably sick of hearing about it. But so what had happened is to, to hold a protest, you've got to basically fill out a Form 1 application and submit it to the police which is, and they get to approve, you know, the routes and the ins and outs of the protests on everything that you put on the form. And it's a, it's a bit ironic, you know, because we, we were knocked back the first time and when you, when you knock back the first time, you get to come up with reasons as to why the police shouldn't knock you back and why the protest, protest should go ahead. Um, and thankfully, I, I, I end up cold calling Felicity Graham, who is a hectic barrister in Sydney, I had no idea who she was. I knew that she ran the first Black Lives Matter protest. It, it was about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> you know, as a, as a frightened law student, um, where you've got, you know, so many odds against you, you've got a whole army of police that have a team full of solicitors, barristers, and here I was, you know, standing with a butter knife against a, te uh, against a team that had army tanks and guns. Um, and so Felicity Graham was, you know, she was really keen to get on board and she said, all right, let's do this, let's come up with reasons. And so we, we built, we constructed this COVID safety plan um, and all the, you know, reasonable steps we're going to take to make sure the protest was safe. But we were knocked back for the second time and the police commissioner of Newcastle said, oh, no, we're knocking you back on health grounds and if you choose to go ahead, I'm going to hit you with a cost order. And for the mob that don't know what a cost order is, it's if you lose the court case, you, you will have to pay for the police barrister, their instructing solicitor, and you would have to pay for court fees. Now, as a final year law student, I didn't have that kind of money laying around. But when you have all these odds against you, you don't care about the risk. You're not thinking about logic. You're not thinking about the consequences. Um, so I just dug deep and I said, righto, let's do this. I, I'm not really care about what's at risk here because my people's lives, my community are far greater than, yeah, it's, yeah, that's how much it means, I think. But I think one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we, we have to keep this emotion of anger because that is what drove me because I was angry. And I hate, you know, I hate to segue into my own little um, podcast work, but, and I talk about this, the power of anger where you know, Malcolm X visited Africa and there were two states. One had more freedom than the other. And the one with less freedom, they were walking around hopeless and sad. 
And when Malcolm X visited the state that had more, more you know, freedom, they were angry. And when you're angry, you get up and you want to do something. And so that's what I did because I wasn't think, thinking about consequences. I, would, I wasn't thinking, thinking about logic. I just thought, let's go ahead with this Supreme Court. And we did. And the police were subject to a cost order. So they had to pay my barrister and the court fees. <laughs> Look, I know um, you, did, you were such a powerful voice during um, those rallies, Tay, and... Um, you know, I know that you, you came through your pug and you were a student here and you've come from Dubbo and I wonder, can you talk about, you know, how is your education here at the uni, um, at Waldatuk and, and as a law student, how has that helped you in fighting those fights, in being able to, you know, take on um, the police commissioner in a, in a case like that? It's helped so much. I don't even think that, yeah, I could fully, you know, I don't think there's an English word in the dictionary that could articulate it. but. If I were to try and articulate it, I'd say it like this. When you learn the language of the oppress oppressor and you're able to articulate how their actions continue to oppress me and my people, then I've ceased to become the victim. I'm no longer the victim. Um, and, you know, being a, being a young black woman in Australia, black women are the most disrespected people in Australia. They are, you know, they are the most... They are women who are constantly beat and subject to all the all types of brutality that you could think of. We are the most disrespected, we're the most underrepresented and I think that's when the police also, you know, they took me a little less seriously because of that. I'm young and I'm black and I'm a woman. Um, but my education has helped so much because I was able to articulate everything in the oppressor, oppressor's language and you know, and we've been, and all of a sudden I've been put on this pedestal, you know, all because I've won a Supreme Court case, which I don't believe I should be. Um, and I say that because, you know, I may have won a victory, but it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's not a victory that you can show me because nothing has come from this. And as far as I'm concerned, um, it doesn't matter how much respect the court or white people or, you know, education system show me, if that respect isn't rippled onto my people, um, you know, who are, who are at the hands of police, who haven't received an education, if that same respect isn't shown to them, then as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't apply to me. Thank you, Taylor. And I know how passionate you are about, about this and I can, hear, I can hear it when you're talking about it. And, um, you know, we're talking about how your education here has really helped you um, in that, in that work, and if I can go back to you, Jeff, and I know that you didn't have the straightest pathway, um, you know, through through school, and I guess now coming out the other side and and doing the work that you do, um, you know, what role do you think education has in in this movement? Education is everything, and, and today I'm <clears throat> I'm so aware of the key to success is in education. You know, after the, I suppose of my a lot of my um, long years of, of, of misery and pain in them dark places, I, I, I end up going back to, to TAFE at the age of 38 and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be where I am today without, without having that, that, that bit of paper. Um, I had knowledge about the lived experience, I had knowledge about you know this and that, but no one sort of wanted to take me on until I had that, that, that piece of paper. So to go back at the age of 38 and to try to spark the brain again, it was the most toughest thing I had to do to get my cert for in community service. But after that, I, I completed that, and then I went and I'd done my diploma in community service as well. And, and, and I know the key to success is in education, and that's where it lacked for me at, in, in my primary school years. You know, you wouldn't think, but I taught Nafe everything he knows. You know, and <laughs> <laughs> no, but but going back because stuff was happening at home. I took that stuff to school with me. Today it's a bit different. It's, you know, we've got the support at school now if there's kids um, falling behind or... But because I took a lot of stuff that traumatised as a kid at home, I took that to school. I was always tarnished with the, 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 the brush of an Indigenous kid that just doesn't want to listen and doesn't want to learn. So I was forever at the, at the principal's office, every day on a day-to-day -day basis. It was like, Jeff, you don't want to listen. I was always at the back of the classroom but what was happening, I was traumatised as a kid. You see a lot of domestic violence, you see a lot of drug and alcohol abuse, you see a lot of this stuff happening at home, you start to believe that that lifestyle is normal. But because I've seen a lot of domestic violence, 
I believe I came traumatised as a kid and I took that, school, tough, took that stuff to school where I couldn't concentrate. And um, our people are, are still in that rut today. You know, they're, they're witnessing stuff at school. So our kids are going to school and, and, and this is why we're, we're falling behind. So I think they've got to start picking up on, on more support around that, on, on how we can support on, on what's going on at home. Thanks, Jeff. If I can jump over to you, Professor Morgan. Um, you've been an advocate of social and restorative justice through education for Aboriginal people for over 40 years, a long time. Um, and so I wonder what role you think education has here when we're talking about Black Lives Matter. Hmm. Well, thank you. And I also would like to acknowledge the traditional lands upon which we're gathered and uh, its peoples. Um, I'd also like to, to dedicate my words today to in acknowledgement of the warriors, Aboriginal, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, who've actually fought the battles over a lifetime mm. to make the type of world that we're still struggling to create. Um, I think it's important, not just about looking forward, but also how important it is to look back and to understand and appreciate where we've come from. Mm. Because the types of freedoms that we have today, the rights and freedoms that we enjoy, they just didn't happen. The, many of those rights and freedoms were hard fought and lots of people sacrificed their lives, um, if we're talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, to creating the opportunities that today many of our people uh, enjoy. Um, I'm not arguing that people don't have a right to the top of things, but I would argue that we need to think of those more in terms of a privilege, a privilege that's been created by others. And we should never forget the history of our country and the journey that we've all been on in this country, where our sovereignty has never been ceded, where <coughs> the issues of social and restorative justice continues to be a constant in the lives that we live. And I guess at one level, I see education as critical to truth telling in the creation of a more just and equitable world. The incidents that, in my opinion, drive the Black Lives Matter movement in Australia and across the world are emblematic of a world suffering a form of moral decay. In the education process, it is not only important to learn, but also to unlearn age-old assumptions and truths that are mired in racism, privilege, and oppression. Equally important, in my opinion, is a need for an education of the heart and the soul. Because it is this form of education, perhaps more than anything else, that liberates silence to challenge atrocities and abuses that unfortunately, unfortunately continue to occur at an ever-increasing regularity. This spiritual enlightenment is critical to addressing and finding remedy to what I refer to as spiritual fatigue. Spiritual fatigue is a consequence of a people who are oppressed, alienated and marginalised. And what I refer to as constantly having to contend with the 40-20 divide. And when I talk about the 40, uh, sorry, 80-20 divide, I want to explain that this depicts the reality of a lived Aboriginal reality that we spend 80% of our time struggling for our rights and freedoms. We spend the rest of our time, the other 20%, defending, explaining, never celebrating what it means to be Aboriginal in this, our unceded land. So I guess in all that, there is a question of the need for Australia, if it's ever, if it's ever going to realise the potential that it truly has, is that it must deal with the unceded sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. This isn't just about land rights. 
This isn't just about Black Lives Matter. This is a question of profound, profound question of sovereignty. And it's only when we understand what sovereignty truly means and how we've never ceded it, will we start to see things happen around Black Lives Matter, around social and restorative justice, in addressing the inequalities that persist to this day. I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather. I hate to believe that when it comes time for me to go to the other world, that my great-grandsons are still going to be faced with that 80-20 battle. But there's no celebration in that situation. So I guess education is critical, absolutely critical. But it just can't be about the education of the mind. It's got to be more than that. How do we become a truly socially responsible and caring society? And economics, neoliberalism, the intoxication of greed can also be a big part in that thing that I refer to as spiritual fatigue. So, uh, yes, uh, let's educate our people. Let's educate non-Aboriginal people too, or uneducate them about their sense of privilege. And perhaps with the world will be a better place. I'm a prisoner of hope. I believe in the capacity of all of us, our common humanity, to overcome so many differences in our society. It requires political leadership. It requires societal leadership. It requires leadership from institutions like theirs. And uh, so I believe that there is a uh, hope for the future, that we will one day be able to look at each other in the eye, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, and truly understand what it truly means to be Australian and what it truly means to be human. Thank you, Professor Morgan. And, and you just talked then about that relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And, and Sharon, I, I'm going to quote you um, from your ministerial statement um, on closing the gap. Um, and you said then, what we're doing is failed First Nations people. And instead of talking about a reset on closing the gap, it's time for a reset on the original relationships between First Nations people and the remainder of the Australian nationhood. <coughs> So if I can ask you, how do we engage with non-Indigenous people in our communities in building those relationships? Thank you, and I will come to the question, um, but I'd also just like to say uh, uh, you know, how incredibly humble I feel to be part of this panel, to be um, sitting in this room with so many of those warriors that have uh, really forged uh, the pathways for uh, many generations and a massive shout out to the dancers from uh, Adamstown Public School. That was so terrific. Um, look, I uh, have sadly made those statements in Parliament for the last seven years uh, uh, really um, around our, um, you know, each year the Parliament reports on how we're going on the Close the Gap targets. And it's uh, always a pretty dismal picture, I have to say. And, uh, and I think by year seven, I was really kind of starting to be more than a little frustrated about a lack of um, any uh, lasting you know, change. And, uh, and it's become increasingly apparent to me that there is a really profound problem with the way in which the, a nation founded through a colonial process. Um, it, there is a lot of unfinished business that has never been attended to and, um, and it remains a, um, a... This is not a problem just for First Nations people. It is a problem for the nation as a whole. And um, I... 
you know, I've given it a lot of thought about there is, uh, you know, listening to your 80-20 uh, analogy just then, you know, I've long thought that it is, um, you know, what role do non-Indigenous people play in this because it is, there are already mass, you know, the exhaustion rate for many uh, First Nations people is already profound. And is it really their responsibility to be educating the remaining, you know, 25 million Australians? So um, I've always had a view that there are um, there are many ways in which um, you know we have to accept responsibility for our um, for our own learnings, for the communities that we live in, and truly getting to know. Um, those communities, and I, uh, you know, had a pretty amazing period of my life where I lived and uh, worked with um, Boonamba people up in Fitzroy Crossing, and um, and it really, uh, you know, in in many ways, I mean, it just made a, a it profoundly changed my life. And I knew when I uh, came back to Newcastle that I had a lot of work to do in my own community. That, um, uh, and so I got involved then with a uh, Newcastle Aboriginal support group when I first came back and uh, um, got to see this building grow. And, uh, and in fact, that group moved across into this building when that was opened up. And sadly, a lot of my elders from that group have passed, and um, and it, but it was a uh, a good introduction. I think you know you have to figure out entry points into communities that live in you know the, the cities or towns that you reside in, and uh, and I think um, for me that was a good starting point. There's not a day where I don't continue to. Um, learn and acknowledge I still have so much to learn, but it is an important part of, um, you know, and the job that I have now in the Australian Parliament gives me a lot of platforms on which to ensure that uh, I use my role to be able to try and have conversations with lots and lots of different people. Um, uh, and, you know, I get to practice my powers of persuasion a lot. Uh, so the, the fact that, um, that the current uh, ways in which we um, seek to address those inequalities isn't working is really problematic. I think there is, as, you know, to go back to your original question, the profound problem is the a lack of a respectful partnership to even begin with. So, uh, what does um, you know? What does a just society look like? What does a genuine partnership with First Nations people in Australia look like? I think there are lots of those conversations starting to happen now, um, and um, and there is a responsibility for uh, all of us to um, make sure that we take full advantage of every opportunity to kind of learn uh, as much as we can. I mean, you know, there is a plethora of pretty amazing First Nation writers, uh, poets, playwrights, dancers, people who are willing, who are telling you, if you listen, if you've got capacity to listen, who are telling you pretty amazing stories every day in this chain. So um, I just think We've still got a very big question around the relationship between First Nations and the nation state. And Sharon, you, you touched a little bit then on, um, I guess, the inaction of government and you know, the fact that you're having these, you're making these statements um, often and for many years in, in Parliament. And um, you know, we've had the, the new national agreement on closing the gap coming out this year um, and with an aim to reduce incarceration rates for Aboriginal people, but no additional funding was allocated in this year's budget um, to cater for those justice outcomes. And what are your thoughts about that? Oh, look, I can see you've got time constraints. I'm going to give you the short answer and it's, it's outrageous. 
I, I don't, you know, I don't think we should sugarcoat that. It is, um, it shows a complete lack of um, genuine desire to um, see change. And if you, you know, there's nothing surer than setting up uh, something to fail by failing to resource it and failing to, um, you know, really um, provide the commitment necessary. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it was the only, not the only disappointment out of that budget, but uh, I think that if, you know, given the year that was, given the focus on Black Lives Matters, given the um, ongoing um, efforts people have made to kind of reset those targets, to add new targets, to have a different story there, um, you know, if now was not the time to properly resource and show a genuine commitment, I don't know when is. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm aware that we do have um, quite a few schools who are watching today and um, lots of our young students who are listening to this conversation. Um, and so, uh, Taylor, as a, as a student yourself here at the university, is there anything, is there any message that you think, um, you know, those young people need to hear? Yeah, if they're watching, my biggest advice is just back yourself. You might be young, but you have over 80,000 years of knowledge, wisdom and legacy that is welded into your bones. Um, always back yourself. Never compromise your principles or your values. Seek advice from your elders, you know, be, be guided by their advice. But at the end of the day, if you make a decision, back your decision and support yourself. Um, back yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. And look, I, I'm going to ask um, all the panellists this, you know, we're, we're, we're seeking to, you know, talk to people about um, what actions they can take to, um, you know, lead towards these better outcomes to be an ally for Aboriginal people. Um, so, Jeff, if I can ask you what you think some of the practical actions that people watching and listening today can take um, to help in sust sustaining this momentum towards positive change. Yeah, so um, me personally, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer that for us to make change, we need the right people in the right positions to make change. You know, if you're not in that, you're not in that position to make change, for, um, we're never going to make change. So you've got to be, if you're in that position to support our Indigenous kids or our Indigenous people, um, especially especially our, our young ones now at school, you, they've got to be um, they've got to be aware of the stuff that's happening. If, if they can see behaviours in the kids um, in the classrooms and and just try to support them kids the best way they can. You know, but like I say, if until we've got right people in the right positions, we're never going to make change. So you've got to be passionate about your change before we can, your position until we can make change. So yeah, just just dig a little bit deeper and, and if you can see stuff going on and, and see what's happening. Don't, don't just tarnish that kid that is just an uncontrollable kid because there's a reason why we act out like that because nine times out of ten there's, there's stuff happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, dig a bit deeper instead of um, tarnishing us with that same brush. Um, Professor Morgan, if I can ask you the same question, what, what advice would you give to people listening today? Uh, well, it's a very complex uh, question, uh, uh, but I think there are some really simple answers. Um, and one of them is that uh, I've always been intrigued in this journey that uh, in Australia we see more and more people discovering their Aboriginal uh, heritage. Um, mm. And I celebrate that. I want people to understand and be connected um, to their heritage. What I worry about is that people allow their identity then to be shaped just by their heritage, not by a sense of culture or a sense of connectedness to country. And country is so pivotal to our identity. If you, people quite will tell you who their people are, but some of those people have never been on country. They've never been there to understand and let the country talk to them about their identity. So my really strong message, those young people we saw dancing, and I love the spirit in that, and I love the energy, and I just want for those young people to also have the opportunity to go into country, to take your shoes off, to learn what country truly means. It's not just about geography. 
country in our context is far more profound than that. So to the young people watching, listening, take your shoes off, find out where country really is, and get your parents and your grandparents and others to give you that type of exposure. And once you feel country, you will know what it truly means to be Indigenous and truly means to be Aboriginal, or truly what it means to be Gamaroi, the centre of my universe, not like the black hole of those other countries that we've heard about. <laughs> <laughs> so, but seriously, um, yeah, I, can't, I can't emphasise enough, in this journey that we call life, explore beyond your own reality. To understand that, as Taylor has said, we come from the oldest continuing culture on this planet. So we're just a, is that just a throwaway line? Or does it truly mean something? And my, uh, um, my advice to young people is to seek out the true meaning of that. It's not just about the journey of the 80,000 years. It's all the things that are connected to it. And when we, are, when we understand that, we will see enormous change occurring in this country. I'm just going to stay with you, um, Professor Morgan, and I'm aware that we're nearly out of time for our discussion, but I watched an interview with um, you the other day and you were talking about um, Aboriginal people taking control of their educational destiny mm. um, and, and the power that... that you know, the momentum that was happening in the 70s and 80s. Mm. And I wonder what you think, looking at the university today, sitting here in Wallatooka, um, you know, got over a thousand students here, at the Aboriginal students here at the university. Mm. Where do you think we are on, mm. on that journey? It's a good question. I think that we've won the battle of access. I think that we've opened up the doors that have been previously denied in terms of the access mm. to another knowledge. We bring our own knowledge with us. But what the academy needs to consider is how do we construct a new academy for the 21st century where the wisdom that's embedded in indigenous culture and philosophy can permeate the top of all the courses that we're teaching in the university so that the attributes that students are graduating from these types of institutions are informed by that truth, that essential truth. I've travelled and I've worked and I've uh, been involved with many other Indigenous peoples in other parts of the world. The thing that strikes me about my journey to other parts of the world is that other Indigenous people across the planet, their fundamental rights and freedoms have been enshrined in treaties. They've been recognised. Their right to education, their right to health, their right to deal with the issues of incarceration, all the other things that we suffer with. We don't have that in Australia. We desperately need a treaty or some type of instrument that gives effect to, and is an enabling instrument that gives effect to, like, for instance, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Great statement, but there is no enabling legislation in Australia to give it effect. So it rests at the position of aspiration. So it's a great aspirational document, but we need to be brave to move beyond just mere aspiration. We deserve that. We deserve that as a country. We, those young people deserve it. All of us in this room, and all those that are yet to be born, deserve that. So if we don't understand that education isn't just about the development of the intellect, it's the totality of who we are as a people, as human beings. How do we better connect with each other? And how do we share this wonderful gift called life? How do we do that? And I think we still struggle. Some politicians, the present one excluded of course, <coughs> they, they've, they've lost the plot. They believe that their right is to govern and their right is to serve. So the greatest, greatest privilege of being an elected representative is to serve, not to govern. And until we shift the dynamics around the politics and all the other things that we see in our country, 
we'll always be sitting in these top of circles lamenting the lack of progress that's being made. And I don't want to be ever in a position where we continue to sit and lament and lament the lack of progress. I want us to shift to a paradigm of celebration where we can celebrate truly what it means to be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but also to celebrate what it means to be human, what it means to be Australian. I want all of us to celebrate that, not just during NAIDOC week, but all time. Look, I don't think that there's a better point to finish this discussion on than, than that. Mm. Um, just the power and the hope for the future that we are all, you know, we're all here together. Mm. We're all in it together. So um, I thank you very much, um, Professor Morgan. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Taylor. Um, and I think we're going to now hear from uh, Nathan Towney, um, who's going to give us a bit of a presentation up here. Um, so I'll hand over to, back to Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, if we could just give our panel members and Lauren a big round of applause. <laughs> it was my decision to go last, and I'm sort of regretting that decision now that I've got to follow that amazing discussion because I could have sat there and listened all day. Uh, what I plan to do now is just have a conversation, and we, we've heard about uh, some really interesting points that the panel have discussed and what I'm going to talk about now is, is what's the role of a university? And you know, I've, I've got up on the screen um, some slides that I'm going to talk through, which we'll, we'll talk through our Indigenous commitment. The university has launched a new strategic plan called Looking Ahead, and these lecture series are based around that. And I think Jeff spoke a little bit about the fact that we need the right leaders in the right positions. And I'm just really proud to work at an organisation that have prioritised an Indigenous commitment as part of that strategic plan. And it is front and centre. It is a, it's, it's not just something that's put on a piece of paper. I feel that people get it and people want to learn how they can contribute to it. And that's not just the amazing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff we have here at the university, but it's all staff. And I'm really proud to work as part of an organisation that does that. And you can see where that sits in terms of the, the priorities. Our Indigenous commitment wraps around all of it and underpins our values of, as an organisation, and that's something that I'm really proud of. Uncle Bob talked a little bit about knowledge and what, what, what is knowledge. And for me, the university is all about knowledge. It's the sharing of knowledge through our courses, but it's also the creation of knowledge, the creation of knowledge through our research and the things that we discover that then impact and influence communities. And this diagram to me really does um, unpack a few things. Because from a young age, we're told what cogs go into our head that becomes knowledge. And our past policies, our past uh, lived experience, all shape what those cogs look like. And unfortunately, uh, Aboriginal knowledge and in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge hasn't really been valued as a cog, whether that's in the school curriculum, whether it's been in programs of study at a university. It's, it's through that lived experience and it's through... Um, when people go and, and take the time to learn and research those things themselves, that it becomes part of that cog. And one of the things that we're doing as a university is starting to make sure that Indigenous knowledge is part of our, our curriculum and part of our learning. And again, that's something I'm really proud of. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we plan on doing that. So from the Looking Ahead strategic plan, uh, the university asked um, myself and the other leaders here at the university, I'd like to acknowledge Kath Butler, the head of Wallatuka, Dr Ray Kelly, uh, deputy head of Wallatuka, Professor John Maynard, uh, the director of Purai, uh, Leah Armstrong, director of Indigenous Engagement and Reconciliation. We, we've been working together a lot to think about what does a whole of university strategy look like? What does it mean to actually implement an Indigenous strategy across an educational institution? because there's so many different things that we need to do and how do we provide that into a framework that leads to action, that isn't just an aspirational plan, that is something that we can live and breathe and that everybody across the organisation sees how they can play a role in delivering this. And that's what we want this document to be. And there are four key pillars that we've identified around that and I'm going to go through each of those pillars now. The first one is around cultural knowledge and understanding. How do we ensure 
that we build capacity, cultural knowledge capacity of not only our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and staff, but all students and staff to ensure that the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, everybody that graduates from this university has a little bit of fire in their belly. I don't know if we'll get as much fire as you take, all right, but, but we'll, we'll take half of that fire, I reckon. A little bit of fire in their belly so that when they go out into their workplace, when they graduate from this university, it becomes a priority for them to be an advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to proactively implement strategies in their workplaces, in their communities and in their homes to change the narrative and to celebrate. And that's what we want to do. We've released a cultural capability framework which will become the vehicle of how we're going to look at uh, implementing that and building that cultural knowledge and understanding of our staff. And it's a document we can be really proud of. I'd like to acknowledge the work of Jake McDonald and Leah Armstrong in the development of that document. Basically, it, it's, a, it's a document that talks about, a lot of organisations talk about cultural awareness. For us, that's the first step. Yep, you've got to be culturally aware. And we've developed a continuum in this framework and the, and the end phase is cultural responsiveness. And Uncle Bob, you talked about being responsive and being responsible. And that's what we want. We want people to be proactive. We want people to be responsive to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That framework, the way that we're going to deliver that, we've developed uh, three online modules, which are developed by our community for our community. A lot of people in the room here feature on uh, in those modules. That's followed up with a three-hour face-to-face workshop with our team, and and by our team I mean a broader team of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff across the university. And then that's followed by an on-country experience. So we actually want our staff to go and connect with local community members. Don't know if they'll get their shoes off, they might. Get their shoes off and connect with where they are. What is significant about this place where they, where they work? What role do they have in connecting to country and how can that influence the work that they do? Because it's when we touch people here that we really get, get a sense for people to want to change and to think about how they do things. And often in universities and educational settings, we're thinking about here. And so we want to touch both. We want to touch here so that that influences what happens here. And the cultural capability framework is what we're doing to, going to use to do that. That's the staff facing piece. We also have a student facing piece. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Professor Mark Hoffman, where we're looking at a, an, an Indigenous graduate attribute, um, an enhanced Indigenous graduate attribute, so that we can really proudly say that every student that graduates from this university will have access to cultural knowledge and understanding, regardless of what program of study they're in. And so that's something that we're really excited about as well. Our second pillar is participation and retention. We want Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be here. And when they're here, we want them to feel safe. We want them to feel valued. And we want them to feel valued in, the, in what they bring to this university. Because when I talk about knowledge, there, there are two types of knowledge. And it's, and it's that ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people understand that the knowledge that they bring to the, this university is just as important. I want to acknowledge the team of Wallatooka, um, in particular the outreach team for the work that they do. It's no, no accident that we have the largest number of um, undergraduate students in the country, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in the country, and that's for the amazing work that happens in that outreach team. I'd like to acknowledge the, the work of Thuru, the Indigenous Health Unit, and the work that they do in supporting students, um, as well as the, the Wallatooka team here that provide that support once students are here. This is a home away from home. I still remember, and I'd like to acknowledge John Lester, uh, still remember having my interview over at the old Wallatooka room next to Bar on the Hill uh, to get into university. And I'm going to be sitting on those panels um, next month with Christy um, Faulkner and the team. Um, to have a new intake of, of students. And this place changed my life. And it was that opportunity that allowed me to do that. So how do we ensure that we provide those opportunities and get the message to as many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as we can to let them know that this place can change your life and that education is so important in whatever field they choose to go. Not only students, we want more staff. We want Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be here as staff members as well. And again, feel safe and feel valued. 
Our alumni are really important. We need to make sure that we engage with our alumni and that our alumni still feel connected to this place. And so that's a really big part of the, that pillar as well. The third pillar is around research, research to influence change. We don't want to research for the sake of researching, to, to publish a paper, to get citations. We want impact in communities. That's what we need. We've, talked, we've heard a lot about some of the um, big issues surrounding our communities. And it's, it's going to be the work that's led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers that will help solve those issues. Not only those issues, but some of the biggest issues facing our globe. First Nations people from all over the world have amazing knowledge that can help solve those. And so how do we tap into that? How do we, how do we apply new knowledge by combining that knowledge with the Western knowledge to, to come up with solutions and connect people together so that we can create that new knowledge? And that's what that research agenda is all about. We've picked out some big research priorities that we want to touch on. Um, health is a big one of those. We're working with uh, Awabical, um, Aboriginal Medical Service. We're working with Hunter New England Health, Hunter Medical Research Institute, and also their equivalents on the Central Coast um, to ensure that we have a, a coordinated approach to Indigenous health research for this region. It's really important, and we want that to be Indigenous-led. We want people in, those, in our communities to become researchers and understand the role that they can play. Language, Dr Ray Kelly, doing amazing work in that space, making sure that all of these research areas are actually interlinked. Cross-discipline research is so important and we need to provide a space that allows that to happen. And that's a big part of our plans moving forward. Professor John Maynard, Professor Vicky Haskins in the, in the global history space, working at Purai, they do an amazing job again. We can't do any of this unless, it, unless the truth is told. We've heard about that today. And history plays such a big part in that. And also ecological knowledge. Traditional land management is so important in today's world. And like I've said, our First Nations people from across the globe have many answers, we've just got to listen. So let's find those answers. Last but not least, the last pillar is around engagement and community collaboration for reconciliation. I'd like to acknowledge the work of Leah Armstrong, Mandy Hawkins and Lauren Collier for the work around our Reconciliation Action Plan. But we don't see our role as just develop, developing a wrap for the university. We also see our role as, as being a bit of a, um, a regional resource around Reconciliation Action Plans. We have a number of industry partners that have wraps and they come to us with employment targets, with procurement targets, and so what role can we play to help service that region? We have a large number of undergraduate students, perfect for employment, fantastic opportunities for our students. We have amazing business school, we have an amazing law school that can help build capacity of our local Indigenous owned businesses. So we can become more of a resource than just developing our own wrap. We can actually help empower our communities through the reconciliation process, which is what it's meant to be. And we want to make sure that, that companies and industry that are developing those wraps are actually implementing them and that, that they're really practical and they're empowering our communities. That's what they're meant to do. And I think we, we can play a role in that. At the end of the day, it's about people. I've got some people up the top there that I really want to highlight. Um, Professor Kelvin Kong, who's a conjoint with the, the University of Newcastle, just received an amazing grant over a million dollars to look at um, ear health, as we know is a big problem in our communities. So an amazing opportunity for, for Kelvin. Um, Gail Garvey on the left, um, this year was awarded the Alumni Medal for the whole of university. That's not an Indigenous award, that's a whole of university award. Um, Professor Gail Garvey is a leading researcher in Indigenous cancer research. He's an alumni of our university. So she's gone out there, she's graduated from here, and she's doing amazing work in supporting that work in, the, in our communities. That's the role that education can play. The person in the red up there, you might have noticed her on your TV screen, Shani Wellington, um, who works for NITV and was a co-host for the first All Indigenous uh, Breakfast Morning Show on NITV during NAIDOC week. Um, there were four people that sort of were running that, uh, that breakfast morning show. Three of those were alumni from our university. Shani was the um, Indigenous Alumni of the Year for 2020 and an amazing achievement. And he's out there as a role model for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and especially young girls. The person down in the bottom right is Professor uh, Linda Ryan. 
who has developed an amazing resource. People may have heard of the Massacre Map, and I just wanted to highlight that it's not just this, the work of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Professor Ryan is an advocate. She's passionate about truth-telling. And if anyone hasn't seen the Massacre Map, I encourage you to Google it. It is absolutely amazing. I didn't realise until I was preparing for this talk that there were some massacres not too far from where I grew up, a place called Mudgee. I always knew there weren't many um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when I played footy against Mudgee. And it really started to hit home then that maybe this is why, because people don't want to go back there. And not only did I click on the link on the little dot that, that represented that massacre, but it actually showed me on Google Maps and Google Earth the site where that massacre occurred and the details of what happened. Very confronting, quite disturbing in some instances, but so important. And I encourage everyone to Google that and have a look. And then I've got some pictures there of our students. They're, not, I, I, they're from our strategic plan, um, those students. And it's important for all of our students to have access to that cultural knowledge and understanding. Because we want more people like Lyndall that will, regardless of what area they go into, become advocates and really do empower Aboriginal communities in where they work. Um, last but not least, I would just like to thank again our panel members. I'd like to thank all of the audience that are here today. Um, as we close, we're going to hear some amazing music from Rudd, uh, Ray Bud Kelly. Um, thank you very much, mate. Really appreciate you taking the time to to um, have some entertainment as we as we zone out. We're also going to have on the screen some images that are going to come up, and there's going to be a lasting message. Um, and I guess what this is 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 a call to action. Uh, Uncle Bob, we had lunch before this, and Uncle Bob sort of said, what do you want to get out of this? What's, you know, what, 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 what are you hoping? And we want people to reflect. We want people to think about, after everything that's been discussed today, what role can you play? Whether you're a student at a school, whether you're in a workplace, what is it that you can do now, either in your workplace or at, in your community or at your home, that can contribute to a positive narrative moving forward? So I'll leave that with you, and I thank you very much. Thank you to the marketing and comms team for all of the work in preparing this, um, this event. Very proud to have been part of it. Thank you. One, two, two. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Ray Kelly, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to thank Lauren and uh, all the organisers for putting together such a wonderful event. Uh, I'm going to give you the quick little uh, demonstration on the Yadaki, uh, but before I do, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge some of our elders here today. So, Professor Uncle Bob Morgan, uh, Uncle Ronnie Gordon, uh, and Annie Laura Williams. Good to see you again. And I'd just like to say um, how good it is to see a lot of our students and staff hanging around and participating in today's session. So, once again, thanks for having me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ray. It's always a pleasure listening to you play. Um, I'd just like to thank, firstly, all of our panellists um, for sharing your wisdom and your time with us today. Um, we truly appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that's come to join us here in Wallatooka. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here um, joining us for these important conversations. And thank you to everyone that has uh, joined us online. Um, I hope that you have uh, learnt something today and taken something away with you um, to join the cause and find your role in this momentum of change. So thank you all. Thank you.